We've been living in the most atypical, bizarre period in human history. The very concept of globalization, the idea that you can participate in some sort of supply chain or source some product or sell some product on the other side of the planet. This has never happened before without some degree of military control and escort. But at the end of World War II, the Americans scrapped the old imperial system that generated the war. And we said that we would patrol the global ocean so that anyone could play. You could sail anywhere at any time, interface with any partner, participate in any manufacturing, access any raw commodity and sell into any market. If in exchange, you would side with us against the Soviets. And that created the world that we know. And it sounds like just a simple guns for butter deal, but you got to remember how fractured everything was before 1945. Mm -hmm. If you were in a country that didn't have oil, then you didn't industrialize. If you were in a country that didn't have farmland, then your population was minuscule. Globalization allowed everyone to sell what they were good at and buy what they weren't good at. And everyone in the world became a specialist. And so we now have soy and far on farms in Iowa that's most productive in the world. But we also have semiconductors coming out of Taiwan, a country that was pre-industrial by every definition until very recently. And every part of the world can play now. And that has encouraged this mass diversification and it's encouraged this mass explosion in economic activity, particularly once the Cold War ended in 1992. But it was already always artificial. And it was always based on the Americans continuing to hold up the ceiling. Uh, the United States has been edging away from that ever since 1992 when the Cold War ended. And we're in the final days of that right now. And that's only kind of half of it. Is when you allow everyone to participate in global trade, people move off the farm and they take services and manufacturing jobs in town. On the farm, kids are free labor. You have a bunch. In town, kids are really, really expensive pieces of loud, annoying furniture. So you right. have fewer because adults aren't stupid. Yeah. You play that forward for 70 years and we have had a population bust in the making global in scope for decades now. Mm -hmm. And most of the advanced world has now aged past the point of no return. That includes countries like China. So in this coming decade, it's not just that we're going to see populations aging out of being competitive. We're going to see populations aging out of being sustainable and actually being countries. One of the many, many, many outcomes of the 2020s is the end of China's unified nation state and as an economy. Uh, but this has all been hardwired in now for 40 years, and we are finally reaching the point where the page turns. Uh, every country is going to have its own story, because every country started aging at a different point, and they started aging at a different rate, and how you live in urban versus rural zones is dependent upon the local geography. So an example on the positive side, we started industrializing in the United States 200 years ago. So for us, this hasn't been a 40, 50 year process. This has been a 200 year year right. process. And so our birth rate has dropped incrementally that entire time, but we've adapted to it as we've shifted into the cities. So the United States still today has the highest birth rate among any of the advanced worlds. We're the most slowly aging country. Mm -hmm. But if you go to a country like say China that only started the industrialization process in about 1985, mm -hmm. they crammed 200 years of economic advancement into 40 years. Yep. That also means they crammed 200 years of demographic adjustment into 40 years. So one of the reasons why the Chinese have been so economically successful in many people's eyes is because they have done 200 years of industrial development, building out industrial plant and infrastructure and power lines in a single generation. Yep. In the United States, we did that very slowly over the generations. We, we didn't finish even electrifying the countryside until the 1960s. Wow, and so that's for us, we were able to adapt each step of this into our cultural evolution. That's one of the reasons why in the United States, you're far more likely to live in the suburbs than the urban cores because mm -hmm. we did this on a slow process and we can make adjustments and people can still have families of size in the suburbs. In the case of China, the population was already relatively high. And when they made the jump, they skipped all the intervening steps. They didn't have to develop cell or telephones that were on landlines. They skipped right to cellular. Right. Yep. And in doing so, they went into denser and denser footprints very, very early in the process. So you went from a subsistence farm to a high rise condo in a generation. Right. And when you're in a condo, no kids. So one child, is that part of it? Absolutely. Yep. 
But one child is the secondary factor in the Chinese demographic collapse. The single biggest one is that they all moved in small condos in a very short period of time and everyone just stopped having kids altogether. So we know now that China will cease to exist as a functional demographic structure and economy this decade because it's not just that they ran out of children. That was 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. They're now running out of 30-somethings. Yeah, sure. So historically, capital and demographics have not been intertwined. Now, yes, as you age, your net worth increases. And as you age, you become more adventurous with your investments. And that drives more economic activity. And then when you retire, you cash it all and go to key bills um, because you won't be able to stomach any sort of market turning or currency turning. That's been true since the dawn of recorded history. There's nothing new there. What is new is the demographic profile has changed. So in a pre-industrial world, you had very few 60-somethings, you had more 50-somethings, and yet more 40-somethings and on down. It built a pyramid. What industrialization and urbanization has done is changed the shape of the pyramid. In some countries like the United States, it's more or less a chimney, but with a bulge for the baby boomers. Mm -hmm. In some like Germany, it's a diamond with more people in their 50s than their 40s, than their 30s, than their 20s, and then narrowing up as you would expect at the top. What's happening globally right now, not just with the American boomers, is that we've got this big cadre of people in their 60s who are moving into retirement and they are a bulge in the structure. So instead of just a small group of people relative to the overpopulation that are moving on and changing their investment portfolios, we have the single largest generation in our history doing that. And on average, they will have completed that transition by the end of this year. So we go from having some of the richest, most liberal, most open, most liquid capital markets we've ever known to something that's a lot closer to the opposite in less than a year. We have our largest generation going out, our smallest generation coming in. So right now, annually, that's 400,000 worker shortage. And that will increase every year until 2034 when it'll peak at 900,000. Yeah. Uh, but we're definitely entering a period of protracted and extended and increasing labor shortage. At the same time, we're entering into a period of protracted and extended and increasing capital. China's collapsing against this backdrop. So yeah. even if we decided we were fine with a completely globalized supply chain, we still need to double the size of the industrial plant in the next few years with less capital and with less labor. Well, the baby boomers at the height of their earning experience. Yeah. And as of the end of next year, they or this year, they won't be earning anymore. So the net inflows into the system from just normal demographic structure dry up considerably. The next generation down, Gen X is very small. Yep. And even if we do succeed in having significant raises now in this labor inflationary environment, there aren't enough of us to generate nearly as much in total. So step one, we're losing volume. Step two, we're losing investment quality because in the flight from risk on to risk off, the capital becomes a lot less interesting. 